if there's nothing further, we will start with number 180. Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Let heaven and earth his praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin awake. Each in his heart sweet music make. And sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. Oh, till to earth both is found God is love in Christ we have redemption found God is love his blood was washed our sins away his spirit turned our night to day and now we can rejoice to say that God is love God is love God is love come let us all unite to sing that God is love how happy is our portion here God is Promises our spirits cheer. God is love. He is our sin and shield by day. I our hope, our strength and stay. He with the free run all the way. Our God is. said he is our sun and shield today. I, my glasses are smudged up. I said the wrong word for that. <clears throat> we'll now have our opening prayer. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Our wonderful God and Father in heaven, may we come before your great throne of mercy this morning, thanking you for this wonderful medium and privilege of prayer. And may we make it a vital part, not only of our assemblies, but our everyday lives, and lean on you regularly. But we do thank you for this public prayer this morning, and you pray, we pray that as we enter into this worship, that we will remember you are our object of worship. And you are here in spirit. And Jesus is here in spirit with us as we assemble to give praise to your name and to sing to one another and encourage one another through songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. We thank you for the privilege of worship that we can because those of us who are your children can come before you this morning and give thanks to your name and may we this day benefit from having been together to grow in our knowledge of your son and our lord and savior jesus christ so that we may live better this week we pray that you would bless the church here and help us to be the kind of people that make it a better congregation. We pray for those who are unable to be with us because of their sicknesses and their personal struggles and 
especially those who have been mentioned in our shut-ins who would love to be out but cannot be out. Sister Hay, who had her accident, and be with Jeremy, and, and any others who, who are having a hard time, and help us to not just pray, but reach out to them and help them as we are able. We pray for the nation we live in, that the doors would always be open to share, share and spread the gospel of Christ. We pray that you give us opportunities to speak to individuals who are in need and desirous of your truth and help us as we present your word to do so in a way that pleases you first and foremost. We pray for our leaders that they would not hinder the work of Christ in this world, that we'd have the freedom to live the Christian life and help us as we live in our families that we'll be the kind of husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and children and parents and grandparents that we ought to be so that any and, our fa any and all in our family can know that Jesus lives with us and us with him. We pray for those who are traveling that are out and about having to go here and there and, and take care of things. We pray that they'll make their destination safely Father, we know there are some who have fallen away from the faith, who have turned their back and their hearts against you and your son and your truth. And we pray that something might be done or said to, to, to shake them and make them understand that their souls are in jeopardy every hour. Help us to be kind in, in our approach, but help us to reach out to those and and help us to help them see the error of their ways. We know that the first day of the week is the day we remember Jesus, our Lord, and in a few minutes as we remember his death, may we focus on that and lovingly appreciate what he did for us. We thank you for worship. May what we do and say today be done in spirit and in truth, and may we go away better prepared to live for Jesus as we go throughout our week. Thank you for loving us. Help us to love you in return. Forgive us, Father, where we have been penitent and confessed our sins. Through Christ I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Next election will be number 111. Number 111. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may feed their joys abroad, may feed Abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through we're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of 
God. The next election will be number 684. <clears throat> <clears throat> this world is not my home I'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Song of invitation be number 23. Number 23. <coughs> Last Wednesday morning we looked at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 and the fruit of the spirit being love this morning let's look at the fruit of the spirit being joy it's always good to be able to assemble with god's people it ought to be something that we look forward to in psalm 122 and verse 1 the psalmist would say i was glad when they said to me let us go up to the house of the lord of course, at that time, the house of the Lord was the tabernacle. Today, the house of the Lord is the church. We ought to be happy and joyful that we're members of the Lord's church, that we're members of the body of Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, we have a contrast between a couple of things. And one in particular is you had a lot of Jewish people in the Galatian churches who still leaned heavily or lean towards the law of Moses. And Paul would tell them in verse 4 that you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. When he says law here, he's talking about the law of Moses, not law in general. We have to obey God, but they were seeking to be justified by the law of Moses. And Paul says, well, if you're seeking that, you're falling from grace. But there's some other things that, that he would say it, with regard to another contrast, and that's a contrast by, of being led by the Spirit and being led by our flesh, our fleshly desires. God's Word has given us, God's Spirit has given us His Word. As we follow this Spirit-provided Word, we are to walk in a certain way. If we're not walking in the way of Scripture, then we're walking in the way of human imagination. 
walking in the ways of our own minds and our own desires. And Paul would say in verse 19, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And he lists several things which are literally sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. These all have to do with sexual infidelity in one form or another. They're worldly in nature. They're not spiritual in nature. And Paul says these are the deeds or the works of the flesh. And it's not like people didn't know what they were, but Paul says this is what they are. But he also lists idolatry. Anything that replaces God is an idol. Sorcery was something that people really practiced. As what some might call as black magic. So you have those false things. And then he talks about some personal things that can occur in between individuals in a person's life. He mentions enmities. That's, that's when there are struggles between individuals that shouldn't exist. Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And Paul is not giving a full list, but he said, and other things that are like this. And, and we know that these are the deeds of the flesh. And, and you think about joy down there in verse 22, we could call these joy robbers. They steal joy that we have in our lives as Christians. You know, you don't even have to be a child of God for these things to be joy robbers, to steal the enjoyment of life. Even a husband and a wife can live together in holy matrimony and not be Christians and be faithful to each other. And their life is a lot better. They're a lot happier people than they are people who cheat on each other and who do other things. And people who never settle down and they're always seeking some new relationship with somebody. And if you spend much time around folks like that, you know they're not happy people. They're not joyful. And, and idolatry, it's an empty religion. Sorcery is trickery. And you know all these other things like enmity, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. These, these are not joyful experiences in anybody's life. And of course, that is the way some of these people of Galatia had lived before. But Paul says, listen, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's very clear about some of these sinful activities. But then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and we talked about love last week, we talked about joy today. And I don't know what joy comes to your mind, what joyful things come to your mind when you think about the word. When I was a child, we were going to Lake Winnipesoka. Now, Lake Winnipesoka was in Chattanooga, is what Wild Adventures is here. We had rides to ride and cotton candy and big old Cokes and, and, and you know, and uh, get to ride the Ferris wheel. That was, that was joy to me as a child, and, and that's all right. Those things are joyful in and of themselves, but, you know, there's a point where even those worldly pleasures or that you're always looking for something new. Well, I, you've been to Lake Winnipesoka. Have you ever have you ridden this roller, this largest roller coaster in the world? And it's kind of like there's always something better, is there seems to be. And people look for that in relationships too, and they're not happy. They can't seem to settle down. And 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 you ask people who really lean on alcohol if they're really happy. No, we're, I'm not really happy. People who lean on trying to take advantage of other people through some kind of trickery. Um, they're, they're not really happy people. And, and, and people of the world who work for money and that's all they work for. You remember what Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes chapter two and how he sought to, to please himself with life's pleasures. And, and you read the list of all the things that he did. And <clears throat> there are some people who might read that list of things that Solomon did, and they said, man, that's great. Why, that man had anything he wanted. You know, there are people who live for just anything they can have physically and sensually without going too far with that idea. And, 
and he talked about the you know the wine and the and, and the and the and he had his own musicians and and he had his own gardens and his groves and waters to to water these things and finally he said but you know I really came up empty it was all vanity and grasping for the wind. Why? Because ultimately those things will not ultimately fulfill because there's always something bigger, something better, supposedly speaking. And, and, and Joy Roberts, you tell me people who are, that, who are happy that, that keep seem to find a relationship with people. God, one of the young men asked me at the school of preaching yesterday, you know, about what can marriage do for our culture? I said, it'll strengthen it. I said, God gave man and woman to be together in the beginning as husband and wife. And, and a good, solid family is the strength of our culture. And it really is. Then, then I said, then you add Jesus to it, and it's an even stronger family. He says, yes, I get that. I'm so proud of him. He's moved to Jamaica from Haiti and started studying English in 2019. And He's doing fairly well, but he had a really good question, didn't he? The people who are living together without getting married and having children outside of wedlock and, and seem to, to want to please themselves with themselves with methadone or by cheating somebody out of money because they feel like they've been cheated in life. They're not happy people. And maybe you have experienced some of those things in your life. I can't speak for anybody else. I know there was a point in my life when I had left the Lord, and, and I've told this over and over and over, I finally realized I was miserable. I was not happy because the Lord was not in my life. And that's what's wrong with the world, isn't it? That's why they're not happy. And, and, they, and, and you have to, let me just say this as we go forward, you have to take all of Jesus or none of him. You can't take half of the Lord. You can't take half of God. You can't take part of Christianity. You have to take all of it. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. So there are things in the world that really don't bring joy. And when you think about giving those things up for a life where there are some people who have made errors in their lives and they cannot remarry they, they just because of what the Scriptures teach. But they can still be happy, faithful Christians. They're around godly people. There are people who have struggled with many, many things in their life, but they came to know the Lord and came to study the Bible, and they started piecing their life together and learning to be honest with people and treating people the right way and learning about serving God and the power of the gospel. Not only does the gospel change your relationship with God, it changes your relationship with other people and, and you just feel better. When you look in the example in Acts chapter 16, we often look at the we often look at the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. But you'll remember in Acts chapter 16, after the Apostle Paul had preached to the Philippian jailer and, and his family, you know, that Barnabas and Paul had been put in prison for preaching the gospel. And and they had been beaten. They'd been put in the inner prison about midnight. They were praying and singing. And all the prisoners heard this. You think Paul and Barnabas were happy? They didn't let that prison steal their happiness. They didn't let that rob them of their joy. And we'll come to that in just a moment. But, but so all the... The jail cells are open, the chains were released, and the jailer comes in there and he sees this and the prisoners are loose and he's about to kill himself. And he doesn't do it. And ultimately, Paul and Barnabas teach the gospel to this jailer and his household. And, and we see that, we see in verse 32 that they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. <coughs> And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. Immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them out into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed 
in God with his whole household. Here's a man who was about to take his very life because evidently if those prisoners had been let go and the Roman, those over him, found out about it, he was a dead man. He thought, well, I'll just take care of that myself. They won't do that to me. And, but then Paul said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're all here. And he preached the gospel to him. A man who was about to commit suicide learns about joy through the gospel. And yet, even in that day and time, why were Paul and Barnabas in prison? They were put in prison for preaching gospel. You ever been put in jail for preaching? I haven't. I've had some people tell me to get up, get away, and they won't hear me anymore, but I've never been beaten up. Uh, it doesn't say it would never happen, but I never have. And yet it could happen. It happened to them. They were beaten for what they for what they were teaching. The Jews were the instigators, but it's irrelevant who it was. The fact was they were beaten for it. You know, when Luke's account of the Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6, Jesus would say in verse 22, Blessed are you when men hate you, and ostracize you, and insult you, and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. Now, think about this for a moment. Jesus qualifies that statement by saying, For... In the same way, for, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. And you read your Bible, if you've been studying Jeremiah and Lamentations, you know he's one of those people who was terribly mistreated. But God sent him. He was treated terribly. And Jesus says, you know, that's happened before, but just remember, you have a reward in heaven. You can't tell me that it would be joyful to experience being beaten for preaching the gospel. Beating would not be fun. I don't believe Jesus enjoyed being crucified, he, but he looked forward to the results for the joy that was set before him. Hebrews 12, I believe it is, verse 2. The joy that was set before him, he despised the shame, but Jesus had a joy in the future, did he not? Why did, why did these men, why did Jesus say to have joy? Well, your reward will be great in heaven. And then I think about how we have this experience in the book of Acts. And the apostles did not have it easy. Oh, I'd like to have been an apostle of Jesus. I, could have, I would have heard him speak and the Holy Spirit would have told me what to say. So yeah, but you might be nearly killed for preaching. And that almost happened to, to James and John. And in, in Acts chapter 6, we see that um, after after they'd been beaten for what 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 uh, what they were doing, notice in verse forty of Acts chapter five, they were flogged by these Jewish leaders. They were flogged in order not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. And the text says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, they're not looking at the future. They're looking at suffering for preaching Jesus. You want to find out where people's heart is if they claim to be a Christian? Let them be put to the test. You want to find out if somebody really and truly believes in what they claim to believe in Christianity? Be put to the test. Let somebody say, you're a bald-faced liar, and I don't want to see you around here anymore. And if you don't get off my porch, I'm going to knock you off of it. And those kinds of things have happened in some places. I remember we were having a campaign in the country of Honduras uh, a few years back. And I was not with the people, but they'd gone to someone's house trying to share the gospel. It was in the capital city of Tegucigalpa, and they came back and reported to the team, said, that fella pulled a gun on us. And I, I thought, well, and, and as, you know, I don't know if he was intoxicated or what. It didn't matter. Pulled a gun on him. They didn't, they didn't fool with him anymore, but they didn't stop preaching and teaching either. Christianity puts you at risk, doesn't it? 
But there's a joy involved. This, this jailer was joyful. I hope you came to, to the assembly day with a joyful spirit like David said that he had when he would come to the house of God. We ought to be happy people. But now, you know, James tells us in James chapter 1, and this is, almost seems ironic when I read it. And let's just say you're a relatively new Christian. And you weren't brought up around Christian people that, you know, and and so you you haven't experienced Christianity in your life, and and so you become a Christian, and the next thing you know, everybody you ever knew just turns against you. You know, back in back in the sixties and seventies, people that believed in Jesus were called Jesus freaks. Well, that wasn't a compliment, was it? A Jesus freak. And, and, and if somebody in my high school claimed to be a faithful Christian, they would have been called a Jesus freak. And, and, that, and I think, well, and it's hard when you're in high school to, to live up to, to that, but, but you know, there's a point where you grow, isn't there? And it doesn't bother you. I don't care if people think I'm a freak. I don't care if they think I'm weird. And I am weird to the world, so are you. <coughs> You're a stranger in this world. And James would tell us in James chapter 1 and verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And you mean we're supposed to think this is a make us happy? And, and he says, knowing that this testing of your faith, this what? This testing of your faith. When you're challenged as a Christian, like Peter, James, and John were out preaching, and Paul was off in stone and left for dead, and you know how they treated Jesus? They would have killed him long before they, they could, did if, if they'd have had their way. And they, and, and they killed a lot of the Old Testament prophets for speaking out for God. And you're supposed to find joy in that. James says, you count it joy when you encounter various trials and knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let's talk about that for just a moment. Say, well, the trial is not physical. Brother Jonathan recently wrote an article about choosing your battles, and he said sometimes your battles, battles choose you, and he wrote a little piece about his mom and the cancer and how hard it was. And Sometimes our battles do choose us, don't they? We have no say in it. I have no say in the dementia that my mother got and made our relationship very strained. It wasn't her, it was the disease, but it was a trial. When people get older, try, younger people taking care of them face trials. And, and someday I may live long enough to be that way and somebody will have to put up with me, but it's not me anymore. We face these trials. We face our own trials. You get, you get told you're, you have cancer. I was talking with Mike Hickson recently about his dear wife, Nancy. I said, she seems to be handling this very well. And he said, I think she is. But not everybody does. You know why, though, we can handle it well is because we know it's only temporary at best, at worst, rather. We're not going to live on this earth forever. Something's going to take us out. It may come like that. It may come over a long, protracted period of time of suffering with some disease. You may lose your mind, and, and you don't even know you're sick, but everybody else does. And, and we face these trials, and then trials of persecution, or many things, but... But James says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, some translations say patience. But I believe endurance is the better word, the ability to keep going. Find joy in this because the, the day is coming when you will leave this world. Your spirit will depart from your body, regardless of the condition of that body. It happens to young people, middle-aged people, older people. <clears throat> And someday that's going to occur with you and it's going to occur with me. And the things that happen in this life are a test. Can we pass the test? Number one, 
Can we endure it? And number two, and this is the hard part, and, and I'm being honest in my looking at it, can I endure it with joy? And James has to teach us. You face these things joyfully. <laughs> because let endurance have its perfect result, knowing so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, it will mature you and strengthen you if we don't face our trials with joy and with faith, and I should say faith and joy, I don't think you can have the joy until you have the faith. You have faith that it, somehow it's going to turn out good. Romans 8, 28 is still in our Bibles. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Somehow, something good's going to come out of this. I may not see what it is, and then, then you go back to Hebrews chapter 12, where Jesus, who he was, he despised the shame, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The joy that he would come out of the grave. The joy that people would hear that first gospel sermon and be saved from all of their sins, every single one. When they repented and were baptized, they came up out of that watery grave of baptism as being born again, brand new, forgiven, blood-washed people. That's joyful. I believe that's why the eunuch, and he, read, he was reading in Acts chapter 8, we read it, he was reading of Isaiah 53, and didn't know who, who the prophet was writing about. said, was he writing about, him, writing about himself or some other? And at that point, Jesus preached Jesus to him. And somewhere in that teaching, Philip preached baptism to him, and he said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And the eunuch said, well, Peter said, well, it, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the the eunuch came up rejoicing and he didn't see Philip anymore. He went to his other, but that man was happy. Were you happy the day you were baptized? Do you remember that? Do you remember what happened that, oh, that I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I'm a child of God. I remember that. But you know, it takes an effort to keep that joy alive. That's an easy day. Everybody's happy. Well, that's just wonderful. We're so proud of you. And, and I remember doing it up on uh, whatever mountain it was at Fall Creek Falls State Park when I was 11 and a half. And we had to walk down this old stone road to the, to the creek. And, uh, and, it was, and we were and come back that night. And two or three of us had been baptized. We were just happy. It was easy. It was an easy night. And it was easy to spend the rest of the week at camp around people of like precious faith and but then you come home to that real world and that joy gets tested doesn't it don't you let the devil steal your joy at work he'll work hard to take it away from you don't let the devil steal your joy at home he'll work hard to take it away from you don't let the devil take your joy on Sunday morning to be able to assemble with God's people I'm convinced there's some people who aren't assembling not because they're sick, but because somewhere along the way they're not happy being Christians. They've lost their joy. And James says, listen, these trials will make you better. They'll strengthen you, make you complete, and you won't lack in anything. But you've got to go through the fire, as it were. And we do. You know, the Hebrews writer talks about this in Hebrews chapter 12. Beginning with verse 11, he says, All discipline, and life does discipline us, for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. And it has, there have to be times when it's hard. Let's go back and let's say that you're a young couple, and you've had your first child. And I read recently about a young couple who did, and the doctor says, Your, ch your infant child has cancer. That would be heart-wrenching. That'd be heart You talk about testing your faith. You talk about testing your joy. But you know what? Some years ago, I remember Brother 
Kenny Hendricks preaching a sermon when uh, a little boy in East Ridge, Tennessee, when I was still living there, had somehow, a young child had gotten up under the family's house and gotten electrocuted and died. And I remember Brother Eddie saying, you know, that had to be hard, hard, hard on those parents. He says, but that little child's just fine. That little child's in the arms of Jesus. He says, that, that chick baby has nothing to worry about. And that's what we have to look at because ultimately, when we do leave this world, where we'll face the Lord in judgment, and ultimately Jesus was telling these people in Luke's account of, of the Beatitudes that, you know, they prosecuted, they persecuted the prophets before, but you look at it with joy because great is your reward in heaven. I don't know how long you expect to live, but I figure you won't live more, you won't live more than the average. You won't, you, there's no, chances are you're not going to live more than the average age. And then what? Well, we get to go be with the Lord if we're faithful Christians. You know, it's hard to live on this earth sometimes. Let's just do yeah, it. Do your head like this. It's hard sometimes. But it's not impossible to live a joyful life. And I'm thinking, well, if the Bible teaches that the fruit of the Spirit is joy, then I need to find a way to be happy. I need to work on it. Try to find the things in this life now that can make me happy. And one of those things that makes me happy is I know that I'm a Christian. When I sin, I have a Father in heaven who has time for me to ask him to forgive me. And he will. I have brothers and sisters in Christ who really care about me. And, and, if you're, and, and, you, and I'm sure you're one of those people that cares about others. And you would help them if you had the opportunity. That's a blessing, isn't it? That's something to be joyful about. I had an issue recently, <clears throat> and I talked to someone about uh, they were asking me a question they needed some help and it and they're in another country speaking spanish well i'm going to answer his question he's struggling with something and that's one of the beauties of christianity not only in the local church but worldwide we can reach out and help people <laughs> and you know we do have somebody to talk to if the doctor does say you have cancer and you die you're not alone it may be hard. It could be bone cancer. It could be in, incurable lung cancer, liver disease. I was talking to a person recently who, who's dying from liver disease, and they said, I know I've done it to myself, and I want to try to help this person say, well, maybe you did. But there's a God in heaven who cares that will bring a certain level of joy to your life that it may take you out, but it doesn't have to take you down. You can go to heaven with the, making foolish mistakes, and it may have been for years, and it happens to people. You see, discipline trains us, verse 11 of Hebrews 12, and it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline will make us live better if we let it but only if we let it. And I think about Jesus, and he's talking in Matthew chapter 24, 25 rather. And he's talking to these people that he's given these talents to. And oftentimes we look at the, the one talent man and we know that he wasted his talent. But what about these people who, we, we live for you, Lord. You gave us talents and, and guess what? We doubled those things. We, we really did what you wanted us to do. And the Bible says in verse 21, his master said to him, well done, you good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. He's talking about heaven. He used what God had given him. In Matthew 25 and verse 23, you have the same thing said to the two-talent man. <clears throat> well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things, or with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. 
In this illustration, he taught Jesus is the judge. And while life may be difficult sometimes, there, come, there will come a day when you won't have to fight anymore. You won't have to struggle anymore. You won't have any more questions. You, you won't have anybody persecuting you or worrying about going to work and this person or going to school for young people, this person gigging you for being a Christian. <clears throat> That'll all be over because they'll enter into the joy of their Lord. The question is, is it worth it? Is it worth it to get up on Sunday morning and, and come for Bible class and worship Sunday evening and Wednesday night and the church has other activities. Is, is that well spent time? Sure it is. It'll strengthen your spiritual thinking and will help you deal with challenges. Is it worth it when, when you hear the gospel and you turn away from people that, well, not turning away according, probably turning away according to them, but turning away from certain kinds of people to live for the Lord. When you decide to obey the gospel, I can't be with those people anymore, but look at what you gain. You gain people who are trying to do the same thing. And when sickness does come or some other calamity comes your way, maybe it's a loss of a job, uh, uh, maybe the loss of your spouse too early in life or even up late in life, or your own health. You have a God in heaven who cares. And Jesus faced more than we'll ever and he looked at the future. I believe that's <clears throat> ultimately the fruit of the spirit of joy is when we get to be in heaven with God, but we have to do what we need to to get there. And if I can do better, I want to face Monday with more joy. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with just as much joy as Sunday morning. And when trials come, I want to find a way to find some joy in it. One of the things you might do, <clears throat> say, you know, I've been through that. Let's talk about it. Bring some joy to somebody else's life. Say, you know, I've been through that. I've lost my husband. I've lost my wife. I, I've, I've seen bad things happen. I've been through difficulties. And the only thing that's helped me is Jesus Christ. And that might help some. You bring joy to somebody else. There may be someone listening online today who's not a Christian and never obeyed the gospel of Christ. God wants to bring joy to your life. He wants you to hear and believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, have your sins washed away, so you can do like the eunuch and that Philippian jailer and his family, be joyful afterward, and live a faithful Christian life. There is joy in Christianity. We have to look for it. There's joy in trials. We have to look for it. There is joy coming in eternity. We have to wait for it. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please do so as we stand and say. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come and thou shalt be richly fed. salvation for whosoever will all things are ready come to the feast come for the door is open wide a place of honor is reserved for you at the master's side Come whosoever will Praise God for full salvation For whosoever will All things are ready Come to the feast Leave every care and worldly strife 
Come feast upon the love of God and drink everlasting life. Hear the invitation. Come whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation for whosoever be seated. If you would turn to number 384, we'll sing Lead Me to Calvary before we take the Lord's Supper, number 384. <coughs> King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light array guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to share thou hast borne all for me lest I forget Gethsemane lest I forget thine agony lest I forget thy love for me lead me to Calvary set apart some time to remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We remember how he willingly gave his life that we may have eternal life with the Father in heaven. We remember how much he suffered we can't even imagine. We know of all these events because we read our Bible and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to read Paul's account of the Last Supper. And we're going to start in chapter 11 and we'll read from verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner he took the cup after supper and saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Well, now I ask Brother Tony to give the prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice he made. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread, which is symbolic of his body on the cross, that we will center our minds on what he did and focus on, on that event. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we would ask a blessing on this cup, Father. This cup which represents the blood that your Son so lovingly said shed on the cross, that we may have eternal life in heaven with you, Father. We pray this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper is our opportunity to give back a portion, for we know the love of the Lord loves a cheerful giver. This morning, our scripture for the collection will come in from, from Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read from chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Our dearest Father in heaven, we pray that we use these funds to further your kingdom, Father pray this in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. service. And now let's close with a prayer, please. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this morning, Father. We thank you for this first day of the week. We had a wonderful worship service, Father, and we are truly grateful. Dear Father, at this time, we would ask a special prayer for all our sake, Father. We have so many, and you know each and every one of their needs, Father. We pray for this nation during our pandemic pray for our nation during all our problems that we have now. We are so thankful for the Son that you sent us for our salvation, Father, for we know we are all truly sinners. We pray all this in your Son's precious name. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Yeah.